You've taken a wrong turn down Creep Street. Citizens of the Milky Way, this is Maureen Bogey. And this is Dylan Hackworth. And you are listening to Creep Street. Thank you so much for listening. We're so happy to have you here. Really quick up top, we just want to remind everyone to please like, subscribe, share, rate. Give us a five stars if you can. We deeply appreciate it. We're on Twitter at Creep Street Pod, Facebook and Instagram at Creep Street Podcast. If you want to join our uh, Citizens of the Milky Way Creep Street fan page, you can go to our Facebook page and it's pinned to the very top uh and there we just like to post some fun articles talk about scary movies games different things like that it's just a fun little place to catch up and chat with other weirdos it's listener suggestion month we're having a great time dylan tell the people what we're getting into today today our listener suggestion comes from instagram user at divine mania woohoo by the way check out his instagram page a lot of super creepy scary art fun love it stuff very cool but his request for today's episode is none other than jeff the poltergeist (gasps) of delby Mm -hmm. otherwise known as Jeff the Talking Mongoose. There he is. But I didn't want to call it Jeff the Talking Mongoose because this little guy is more than just a mongoose. Oh my God, so much more. So much more. We're so proud of him. So this story centers around the Irving family. The father, Jim Irving, we'll just call him Jim. Okay. His wife, Margaret, and their daughter, Voiry. And I'm almost certain that's how it's pronounced. Voiry. It's, it's, it's spelled V-O-I-R-R-E-Y. They had two other s- children who were grown, an Elsie and a Gilbert, who lived on their own in Liverpool and London. Jim was an educated man who used to work as a traveling piano salesman. Oh, that's hard. But after retiring, Jim and his wife and daughter bought an isolated farm on the west side of the Isle of Man. Oh, lovely. And the farm's name was Dorlish Cashin, which is Manx Gaelic for Cashin's Gap. Oh, cool. Now, while the farm was a sort of retirement project for Jim, it was proving to be financially insufficient. On top of this, life here was completely different than their lives in London. They had no neighbors, no telephone, no electricity. So, our story begins here on the Isle of Man on September 13th. 1931. And it's on this day that Jim says he first saw Jeff, describing him as a weasel-like animal that had found its way onto the farmyard. But this little furry guy was unique. Jim says the animal could bark like a dog and meow like a cat. (gasps) What? In fact, when he noticed this, he responded to it by mimicking other animal noises, you know, like oink oink or whatever, you know, animals make that, Mm. you know, you would hear on a farm. You gotta, yeah. And immediately the animal would repeat back the sound. (gasps) Oh, okay. It wasn't long before the family began hearing scratching and thumping noises in the walls of their home. Oh, no. They figured it had to be a rat infestation or something like that, and they even tried several times to trap them to no avail. Yeah. But when Jim made one last-ditch effort to scare the rats away by growling like a dog, (gasps) he heard something growl back at him from within the wall. Wait, okay, so something within the wall growled back? Growled back at Jim. That's scary because I have had things living in my walls before, which, by the way, don't do that if you can avoid it. Um, But it is scary when that happens. If if anything ever growled back at me, I think I would just snap. Oh, fuck yeah. Well, Jim realized this was probably the same animal he had seen in the farmyard. Sure enough, when he would make various animal sounds, it would mimic them. Oh, okay. It would even make the sound of gurgling, almost like a baby. Jim even noted this once in writing, saying how it seemed the animal was trying to talk. And as time passed, he did just that. Okay. The daughter, Voyery, was quite taken by the family's new cast. Often she would have it repeat back nursery rhymes to her in its little high-pitched voice. Oh, so it's so it's speaking English now. It's now speaking, yes. It is speaking the kings. The family soon started to call the little animal Jack until it specifically told them it preferred the name Jeff. Oh, okay. Good for the little guy. He's like, excuse me? No, my name is Jeff. 
Thank you. Sp- specifically, Jeff spelled G E F. Oh, he's he specified the spelling. Yeah, he even oh. specified the spelling. Jeffs that have their names that's not J E F F, they do like to correct you to tell you that oh, it's yeah. spelled differently. Yeah. Jeff said he was born in Delhi, India, in 1852. Oh. And that he had come to the Isle of Man 20 years earlier by a farmer who had brought mongooses there to curb the rabbit population. <gasps> He said he could always understand human speech, but it wasn't until he met Jim that he actually learned how to speak it. Okay, Jeff. Well, rumors of what was happening began to sweep across the island. Likewise, rumors that it was all a hoax were spreading too. Right, because they're just going around and saying like, hey, there's a talking little friend in my wall. Right. Particularly, there was rumors going around that the daughter, Voiry, was driving this hoax. This was even reported on by the Manchester Daily Dispatch. Voiry's classmates said that she would often entertain them with awesome, like, spot-on imitations of animal noises. Oh. In fact, in 2001, a Kathleen Green, who was an old friend of Voiry, was interviewed on Manx Radio where she said that Voiry had the ability to throw her voice. Oh, okay. Now, the author of the book states that, however, considering the amount of investigation that went into this by news outlets, by investigators, it's almost impossible that a child could fool adults by throwing her, by using a ventriloquist voice. Yeah. Essentially. Like maybe at first, who knows, you could trick your parents right. and stuff. But after a while, it was like, this is pretty extreme. Right. And actually, they the book even describes how there's, I guess there's not, there's really not anything. There, there really is no such thing as throwing your voice. It's right. a way of muffling it to ma- and, and, and using distraction to make it seem like it's coming from the dummy or whatever it yeah. is you're operating. This isn't to say that Voiry wasn't somehow involved. Okay, Voiry. In the Jeff story, though. One of the main prominent theories as to what Jeff actually was, was a poltergeist. And what do we know about poltergeists? They're little sneaky little guys. They're often found in the home with young people in it, particularly Mm -hmm. young girls. Yes, we're talking adolescents. We're talking, you know, the flowers blooming. I'm winking my, my, I'm winking right now. You can't see it, but I'm winking. Right from the beginning, investigators assumed that this was a haunting of some kind and possibly a poltergeist. Jeff could produce knocks and raps from all over the house practically simultaneously. He would chuck items at the Irvings <gasps> and their guests from cracks in the panel. So he just threw stuff, but did he anyone just, see like, him no throw it? No one could it? actually see where it was coming from. But just all of a sudden things would like be flying around. Things would fly at him, yep. Whoa. Jeff also claimed that he was able to travel all over the island and would even come back and repeat back entire conversations <gasps> he overheard to the Irvings. Oh my God, it's an Amazon Echo. He also loved to sing songs that the Irvings had never heard of. But most of all, Jeff had a deep and rich catalog swear words in his vocabulary Jeff. that could make Samuel L. Jackson blush. Mm. Jim was beginning to buy into the fact that this might actually be a poltergeist. Right. He had begun to believe that Jeff had the ability to become invisible, even change his shape. Jim actually mentions this in a letter he wrote to one Captain James McDonald, which was actually a pseudonym for Captain James Dennis. And had anyone seen Jeff yet? Only the family. The family had seen Jeff. But others had heard Jeff. Right, right, okay. Early in 1932, my daughter and I were alone in the house, broad daylight, and I chanced to look through the window of the room we were in, and I saw to my surprise a very large cat, striped like a tiger. We ourselves did not possess a cat, and I called Voiry to come to the window to look at it. She did so and remarked on the size of the cat, but... More especially, the unusually large bulldog head it had. The cat then walked away from the door of the outbuilding, where it was standing about 40, 50 feet away from us. And then I saw it was a manx, tailless cat. And I was then a little more surprised, as the pure manx cat is usually smaller than the English. I thought there's no ordinary cat, so I slipped a cartridge into my single-barrel gun and took a go after it. Personally, I'm not very fond of cats and do not kill for killing's sake. The cat was a little bit ahead of me, but easily within range, and it turned through an open gateway into a grass field. I was there a few seconds behind it, fully expected to see the cat, but no cat could be seen. Look as I like, the field was level, and there was not a bush or any roughness where he could have hidden. And the hedges were all earth, or sod hedges, as they, they're called here. I detailed my experiences to my wife on her return home that night. When Jeff called out, It was me you saw, Jim! Further explanation is beyond me. March 4th, 1935. 
Jim. If you're not sure what something is, shoot it. Well, that was what I was going to say. You know, today you would take a photo. Well, yeah, what? Back then you didn't have a choice to like whip out a, I mean, there was cameras, but not cameras like we, you couldn't just whip out a camera. Right. Kind of shooting something was the only way you could get proof of something That's was insane. fucking shooting. I know, but he was like, I th- he thought it was a cat. You know what I mean? Like, what if that was someone's pet? And he was like, well, I fucking It's like, shot no one's going to believe me. I've got to kill this thing. Well, one day, three young fishermen from the nearby town of Peel made their way to the farm to get a look at this magic mongoose everyone was talking about. Oh, yeah, we got to get in on it, yeah. The Irving family warmly invited them in. They had them seated and were engaged in friendly conversation when one of the men began to move his hand as though he was petting something. (gasps) When he asked the family about the white pet cat (gasps) that was now sitting on his lap, they were confused. First of all, they didn't have a cat, nor did anyone living nearby have a cat. And secondly, no one else could see this fucking cat. That is so spooky. Ah. By now, word of the phenomenon was spreading and reporters and paranormal investigators began to visit the house regularly and try and, you know, experience this encounter for themselves. In 1932, a psychic researcher named Harry Price sent his friend, Captain James James McDonald, the guy we talked about earlier, to check out these claims and see if they were true. Well, between 1932 and 1935, Captain McDonald would visit the farm three times. He never once saw Jeff, but had spoken with him numerous times and and numerous times also had, you know, shit thrown at him from, uh, you know, no observable source. So Harry Price, along with Richard Stanton Lambert, journeyed to the farm to get a look for themselves in 1935. But while on their journey, Jeff told the Irvings that Price was a doubter (gasps) and therefore he would refuse to let himself be seen or heard. (gasps) Ah, okay. he did just that. So in his 1936 book, the haunting of Cashin's Gap, Price admits that while it could have been a hoax, there was still enough evidence that it could not be outright dismissed. Hmm. Now, this is where Nandor Fodor enters. <gasps> okay. Side note, Fodor is one of the big names in paranormal research. Today, when we think of paranormal research, you know, you, you, it's very, you know, you think of, you know, dudes with soul patches and cargo shorts. <laughs> it's not the case. He was from a time when investigating the paranormal was approached very academically. Yes. Uh, not like it is today. Not that that not that it's not happening today. It's just not as widely regarded and reported upon. Right. Fodor was considered a leader in the research of poltergeists and hauntings. And at one time, he was an associate of the one and only Sigmund Freud. And he wrote on various subjects, such as prenatal development, dream interpretation, etc. But what he's perhaps most known for is his 1934 book, Encyclopedia of Psychic Sciences. Well, in 1937, Fodor was the research officer for the International Institute of Cyclical Research. And this is when he traveled to Irving's farm on the Isle of Man to get a taste of Jeff for himself. Oh, okay. So he stayed with the Irvings for a whole week. Okay. Now, by this time, the Jeff thing had been going on for about five years. Jim Irving told Fodor before he came that chances he would actually get to see or hear Jeff were very low. In fact, Jim even said that Jeff had grown more surly. <gasps> In demeanor. But nevertheless, Fodor made the trip out to the farm, and to no surprise, Jeff never appeared or uttered a word. Jeff is pissed. Fodor's stay at the farm was not entirely uneventful, however. On one night, Fodor had rocks thrown at him that seemingly would come from nowhere. Oh. And then on another occasion, the kitchen door banged twice, which it didn't normally do. Jim maintained that in 20 years, the wind, that neither the wind or a draft had ever made the kitchen door bang. As with most paranormal investigations, there wasn't enough evidence to indicate something was going on, yet nothing with enough weight to actually make any claims. This happens all the time. This bummed Fodor out. In fact, it bummed him out so much that on leaving, he actually wrote a little letter to Jeff. (gasps) Dear Jeff, I'm very disappointed that you did not speak to me during the whole week which I spent here. I came from a long way and took a lot of trouble in collecting all your clever sayings. I believe you to be a very good and generous mongoose. I brought you chocolates and biscuits, and I would have been happy if you had done something for me. I cannot prove he is an animal. I have not seen him. He did not talk to me. He claimed to be an animal. I cannot disprove that. Jeff is just a naughty little mongoose. Well, Fodor would later speculate that Jeff was actually a poltergeist centered around the daughter of Oyer. But years later, he would change this hypothesis 
to the possibility that Jeff was actually a split personality of Jim's. <gasps> really? Well, not much is known about Jeff after the Fodor investigation. Jim Irving would pass away in 1945 from pernicious anemia. This is where the story now jumps to the daughter, Voiry. See, Voiry had moved back to England in 1939, partly to work as a machinist to help during the wartime effort, mm -hmm. but also because she loathed the whole Jeff saga and wanted to be as far away from it as she could. Yeah, I mean, it's fucking weird. But decades later, in 1970, Voiry would grant a rare interview with the famed paranormal magazine Fate, <gasps> which Fate magazine follows us on Twitter, by the yeah, way. Yeah, we're very yeah. excited about that, honey. At this time, Voiry was 52 years old and had refused any requests for interviews. But that changed with Fate Magazine journalist Walter McGraw. Oh, McGraw. As for what happened to Jeff, Voiry said she had a clue. The last she remembers hearing him was sometime during 1938 or 1939. He would go away for longer and longer stretches of time. Hmm. Finally, he just seemed to go away altogether and not come back. No goodbye, no explanation. In February of 1947, Two years after Jim Irving passed away, the Isle of Man examiner ran a story about the current owner of the farm, or who was the current owner of the farm in 1947, who was a retired army lieutenant named Leslie Graham. Graham reported that while he was putting away his motorcycle one night, he was startled by an animal with gleaming eyes. Mm. He said it was like a weasel, but bigger than a weasel, okay. more like a skunk. <gasps> so Graham set a trap for it. And sure enough, one morning, he found he had trapped it. <gasps> he said it snarled and spat at me and clawed more venomously than anything I'd ever seen. So he clubbed it to death. Oh my God, he clubbed it to death? He had to club it to death. No, he did not have to club it to death. Well, he clubbed that motherfucker to death. Oh my God, get, get a knife. Get a gun. When presented with the photo, this was not, of course... The same animal Voyeur had seen. So this was just an animal that was trapped. Right. So this, Jesus this, Christ. yeah, exactly. So this animal was three feet long with black and yellow molted fur. This does at least prove that whether Jeff or not, there was some strange animal that lived near the farmhouse. But when McGraw saw a photo of the animal and showed it to Voyeur, she said it looked nothing like Jeff. But also Jeff maybe could have like been switching it up. You know, he, so maybe true. that's a part of it. That's very true. She went on to also say, that she hated Jeff and that she wished he never would have come upon her family. <gasps> really? She said that in the early days, her and Jeff were inseparable. They played games together and ate sweets. But as time went on, Jeff got closer to her father, Jim. And Fodor made a special point in his research. He stressed the point that it seemed as though Jeff had outpaced the child intellectually. Yeah. And had then moved on to an adult. Interesting. It was like Jeff thirsted for knowledge. This guy, it's in which made me think it's almost like this thing needed to learn, right? Until finally it had learned everything it could from the Irving family and then just went away, exactly. Like, it, that's what I was thinking too. It sounds like it's some sort of creature or something that can ha, is very, very intelligent and has a, a great potential for knowledge, but it, it needed to like learn by watching or exactly. by uh, like basically through osmosis essentially exactly. and, and then like he he got all he could get out of it and he's like i gotta move on to the next thing it, it makes you it's it's curious because then it makes you think because and this is the reason why i didn't want to call the episode jeff the talking bongos because to me i think that was just a form right 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 I, I think he appeared in a form that was not frightening if this is all real my assumption would be that he appeared in a form that seemed harmless Right. And, and so that he could learn everything he needed, learned how to talk, learned how to, you know, learned wit, learned humor, learned. And then he would travel around the island to other people, learn different things. Mm -hmm. learn, and then all of a sudden one day he's gone. It's almost as if he learned what he could. Now he went on, you know, probably went to other places. To, it makes you wonder, like, well, what if he then took the form of a person and is now living amongst us as a person? We don't know. Because it is weird. It's because it's like he, he got the animal noises so quick. Exactly. And then it went into this like baby gurgling and then exactly. got into nursery rhymes. It's like it's everything is like basically it's just like human development, but just turned up so that like times 10. You exactly. know what I mean? Exactly. So much faster. But it was like Jeff thirsted for knowledge. It was very strange. Now, as Voiry got older 
Jeff went from a cute playmate to a burden. She was getting older and wanted to make friends, probably wanted to meet a boy too. And she even said this in the interview. She goes, because she's 50, at the time of this interview, still was not married. Oh. Because, and it was kind of sad because she's like, well, how could I ever explain this? It's a thing that happened to me. So it wouldn't right. be right to keep it secret. But at the same time, how could I ever explain this to a man's family? And and have them just be like, oh, wow. Okay. Like every, they would always think like, oh, what's wrong with her? Like, wow. And it's sad because she, she doesn't deny it. She says this happened. And because of that, I'm never going to marry because who's going to, it just breaks my It just said that that's bit. how she, she doesn't think she would be able to find anyone that, but you can, there's always, there are people that are so understanding out there at Creep Street, you know, just keep. Absolutely. Keep going. You know what I mean? Now, there has been many cases of talking animals throughout time. Jeff is not Jeff is not the only one. Dr. Doolittle, hello. <laughs> this book of ours that I used as my source had a little blessing inside of it. It had actual phone conversations of one Paul Dale Roberts, HPI's esoteric detective, of people who have called him claiming to see talking animals. Oh. And we're going to do a little reading for you right now. Enjoy. I got this phone call the other day from Josh Mayfield of Riverside. It's an interesting sighting. Paul, I heard you will be going to Los Angeles. Do you think it is possible that you and your wife, Deanna, can investigate an area of Riverside while you are down there? What for? Well, me and my buddy saw a bunch of chickens head over to our moving car, and when the chickens dispersed, there was a man standing there. He looked like a man from the 1930s. As we did some research, it looks like he may be the ghost of Gordon Stewart Norcott. I saw his picture on the internet, and it was the same thing that I saw in Riverside. I am almost sure it was Gordy. What is also really strange is that I brought my dog. My dog is a German Shepherd named Mowgli. Mowgli started acting very strangely. Then Mowgli looked at me, and out from his mouth came the word Gordy. Sure, there were some ruffled barks in the beginning, but the word Gordy was very clear. I couldn't believe it. My dog, Mowgli, actually said a human word. Wow, that is absolutely weird. I wonder if Gordy possessed your dog. By the way, what street in Riverside? Main Street. And when did this happen? A couple of weeks ago. Did the ghost pose a threat? No, but he looked real evil-like. How do you know what you were looking at was a ghost? Because it vanished before me and my buddy's eyes, and so did those chickens. Who is this Gordon Stewart Norcott? Did I get the name correct? Yes. He was known as the Wineville Chicken Murderer, and he would kidnap and murder little boys. This happened in 1928. He would torture the boys on his chicken ranch. He committed all kinds of murders in Los Angeles and Riverside counties. Many people say that he used quicklime to dispose of the bodies. When the police were on to him, he fled to Canada, and he got nabbed in Canada. What was even more bizarre is that when I got home, Mowgli was acting weird again. And he ran up to me and seemed like he was going to bite me. I, I pushed him to the side, and he actually said, You will die. You're telling me that your dog said you will die. Then it sounds like this deceased serial killer was possessing Mowgli. Is Mowgli back to normal again? One particular night, Mowgli jumped on my bed and he was panting as he stood on my chest. Mowgli's eyes looked like they were a bright sky blue when in reality they are brown. I could feel Mowgli's saliva drip on my chest and Mowgli says in a deep human male voice, I lust. I hate. I kill. I screamed bloody murder and grabbed Mowgli and threw him hard against the wall, and he let out a yelp. The next day, Mowgli was back to normal, and he seemed like he was afraid of me because I threw him hard against the wall. I hugged Mowgli, and I apologized for my aggressive behavior. Since that incident, I had no more problems with Mowgli, and he is a normal dog, and no longer does he speak the English language. He speaks dog once more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is one incredible story. Before you called me, my wife had a vision of a talking dog. She had this vision two days before your phone call. The dog appeared to be a German shepherd, or 
maybe a wolf, and it was telling her to stay away, stay away. Maybe her vision is telling her to stay away from Riverside. I don't know. If you want to talk to my wife about your experience, she can conduct a blessing in your behalf and Mowgli's behalf. Her name is Deanna Jackson Stinson, and you can find her on Facebook at Sacramento Paranormal Help. Good luck, Josh. Thank you for the story, and if we get down to Riverside, we will look you up. Special note. The only other talking dog I know of that is also associated with a serial killer is the Son of Sam dog. The Son of Sam supposedly received his instructions from his neighbor's dog. And now, phone conversation part two. Once while at the movies with HPI paranormal investigator Sherry Ulner, I got a phone call. My paranormal cell phone vibrated in my pocket and the number that appeared was unfamiliar. I listened to my voicemail and the call was marked urgent. So I walked out of the theater to take the call. Hi, I just got your call. Am I hearing you right? A talking squirrel? Please explain. I live in Carmichael and I was not drunk or anything, but I have poltergeist activity in my house. Poltergeist activity? And what is it with the talking squirrel? Like Rocky the Squirrel? Ha <laughs> ha! I couldn't hear your name clearly on the phone. What's your name again? Oh, I'm sorry. Jesse Saldana, please, don't laugh. I am serious. Yes, I will tell you about the squirrel, but can I first talk to you about the poltergeist activity? Sure, and I apologize for laughing. I didn't mean any harm. <laughs> That's okay. I know it sounds stupid, but it's true. Late at night, cabinets open up, chairs move across the room, knockings are heard. This all started about a year ago. Anything significant happened a year ago? No, not really. Nothing? Hmm. Did you purchase anything or bring anything into your home that you would consider unusual? Funny you would say that. I bought some old tarot cards from an antique store. Get rid of them. I believe that may be the cause of your problems. How much did you pay for them? Uh, $150? They were really old. You're going to take a loss of $150 because you are going to get rid of them. Are you okay with that? Yes, how should I get rid of them? Take them to hallowed sacred ground like a cemetery and bury them. Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. When you do that, I will conduct a blessing of your home. Now, tell me about the squirrel. Well... Two nights ago, there was this squirrel that was perched on my fence. I went over with my cell phone to take a picture of the squirrel, and I noticed it had red eyes. It looked at me and said, Your time is near, and it scurried off. I started crying and fell to my knees. I was so scared. Have you ever heard of anything like this? Yes. There was a talking mongoose. Actually, a, a talking weasel named Jeff. 1930s. He was talking to all of the villagers in the Isle of Man. Jeff claimed he was born in New Delhi, India in 1852. He was full of wit and sometimes threatening remarks. He was even known to sing Home on the Range. You know, some people theorize Jeff was possessed by an evil spirit. Have you seen this squirrel again? No. Should I be afraid? Extremely! This squirrel is definitely malevolent and is connected to the poltergeist activity. I want you to get rid of those tarot cards immediately, and I want you to bury them at the cemetery. Will you do this? Yes, tomorrow. Okay. Keep me appraised on what occurs after the burial. If the activity continues, I will schedule for an investigation and a cleansing. And when you get rid of the cards, I will come over for a blessing of your home. Are you okay with that? Yes. Thank you for all your help. I will be in touch. You're welcome. And God bless. And finally, you may be asking yourself, so what kind of things did this Jeff actually say? Well, thanks to jeffmongoose.blogspot.com, we have a whole litany of Jeff quotes. And these begin now. I'm an earthbound spirit. I am not a spirit. I'm a little extra, extra clever mongoose. If I were a spirit, I could not kill rabbits. I am a ghost in the form of a weasel. I shall haunt you with weird noises and clanking chains. I know who I am, but I shan't tell you. I'm a freak. I have hands and feet. 
If you saw me, you'd faint. You'd be petrified, mummified, turned into stone or a pillar of salt. I'll split the atom. I'm the fifth dimension. I'm the eighth wonder of the world. I was born near Delhi, India on June 7th, 1852. I've been shot at by Indians. I'm a marsh mongoose. I am not evil. I could be if I wanted. You don't know what damage or harm I could do if I was roused. I could kill you all, but I won't. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap it up for Jeff, the poltergeist of Dalby. What a spooky, scary, crazy little mongoose friend. I'm glad Banshee doesn't fucking talk. I know. She's been staring at us this entire time, just laying on our couch. She just looks at us and wonders what the hell we're doing. Mm -hmm. We say she produces. That's what. She's our producer. She kind of is, and she really is, you know? Well, once again, thank you to Instagram user Divine Mania for such a wonderful suggestion. Yes, so fun. It was such a blast researching Citizens of the Milky Way. My name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. Good night and goodbye.